Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm your host, Sean T. Welcome to Trust and Believe. Today, you are going to trust and believe in a way that you have never trusted and believed before. We have the amazing Shirley Ralph on our show today. You may know her from Moesha. You may know her from Sister Act 2. You may know her from the original Dream Girls, but she is going to provide you with so much information and so much encouragement so that you make better choices in your life and believe in who you are. So sit back, get ready to trust and believe. Somebody say it again. No, no, no. What's up? This is Sean T and it's time to trust and believe. Cheryl, oh my goodness. See, what the people who are listening to this podcast don't know is that we could have started like 40 minutes ago, 45 minutes ago, and we ran into some issues and you said something that was so incredible. You were like, no stress. And in my book, Tears for Transformation, I talk about one of your superpowers that you should build on is your ability to be flexible and creative is another one. And so when you said that, you know, I was already in this place of, well, I'm not going to stress, but I have this incredible guest today. And so my, my worry of inconveniencing you came out, but then you just flipped the script on me and you then were like, no stress. And you all have already built that superpower. So can you let people out there know how to keep it cool, calm, and collected? You know something? Somebody said to me something about a trigger. And they said, oh, I just mm-hmm. got triggered. Or, oh, that was a trigger. And I think the trigger is like a switch. Except the the mm. trigger, I think, probably has much more devastating results. A switch is probably just a change or the bringing of light or the absence of light. So when we talk about flipping the switch, I thought to myself, wait a minute. Why get upset about something that's no problem? No, there's, there's no problem. It didn't, nobody lost their life. Nobody lost any money. But you lost a little bit of time, but as long as we're alive, we've got lots of time. Although I believe we never have as much time as we believe we have. But I'm like, let's just make better choices for ourselves. Don't worry. Be happy. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I, I don't even I don't think I've ever thought of it that way. Meaning when you get into a stressful situation, the thing to do is make better choices for yourself, right? Like that is, that's pretty incredible because I think we, we think so much about the outcome rather than the actual decision that you're making and how it feels at that moment, Absolutely. you know? Absolutely. And we always, we hear all the time, life is about choices and we were, it's so simple it's complicated and we just refuse to realize you can make good choices or you can make bad choices. You know, to me, it's like, are you a good witch or are you a bad witch? <laughs> what are you? Well, if you think about uh, me, I'm a good witch exactly. all the time. Okay. At least I try to stay in that lane. There are some days, you know, I think more internally, I have to battle the bad witch more than I let it show itself externally, right? Because I think we all have this, a lot of times, maybe, I don't know if it subsides as you become more, you know, mature, but there are a lot of times where, you know, you have a work meeting or you're, you know, it could be something about your house or your car that you battle this thing where you you say to yourself, am I going to respond this way? Am I going to react this way? Or am I going to have an educated, mature response? That takes time, too. That takes time. You know, life is a habit. We live this mm. life and life 
is a habit. I lost my mother two years ago, and I was very fortunate to have had my mother such a long time in my life that I had a constant habit of loving my mother. So now that my mother's not here, I still can't get rid of the habit of thinking, oh my God, I need to call her. Or why didn't she call me? Or what would she think about this? Because that's my habit of love with my mother. So we have these good habits and then we have these bad habits. You know, when you talk about the whole transformation and all of that, you know, and people, okay, like we talk about, like if we, uh, when you're going to gain weight and lose weight and people say, well, I just plateaued and it's just, you just plateaued because you're still making the same choices. So you're at a plateau. So it isn't until you make a different choice, and usually it has to be a drastic choice, that you say, <laughs> oh, now I figure out how to ascend or go down again. Simple as that. Simple as that. But we want to make it complicated, saying, I've done all of this, I've done all of that. Yeah, but what is the one thing you haven't done that you need to do in order to make the change? I, you know, I say to people, and I actually just before we started recording this podcast, or just before we started running into the issues to record this <laughs> podcast, I actually, I actually posted uh, something that said, just, just if you just take a step in the right direction, you can have the ability to acknowledge transformation. Hold on, you know, because you I could have stopped. Go you ahead. Could have stopped right at if you just take a step into the right direction, dot, dot, dot. You could have stopped right there. That's a choice. That's a choice. That is. Okay. So there was one time years ago and I've, and I've, um, I've kind of used this even for my own mantra in my life where I was talking to a friend and I don't think I was necessarily going through anything, but we were just having a really open conversation like we are today. And, you know, he said that your ability to make your um, to make a choice is kind of like your biggest, your most, I don't know, not expensive, but your most important currency, because you always have the ability to make a choice on how you're going to respond to something. But I think that the deeper thing is, and this is what I want to know from you, is what about the people who battle with, like we spoke about before, what about the people who battle with the outcome? Where the outcome, they can't make a choice because they're so worried about the outcome. You know what? My mother used to always say to me, because, you know, my mother was a big church woman, right? My, hey, my mother used to, we can sing some hymns in here, <laughs> okay? And my mother would always <laughs> say, if you're going to pray, don't worry. And if you're going to worry, don't pray. And at first, there were these times I used to want to say to my mother, oh, my God, Mommy, please. And then I realized, <laughs> oh, my God, she's making so much amazing sense. If you're going to pray on these things, if you're going to meditate on these things, if you're going to study on these things, if you are going to choose to take the step in the right direction, don't worry. The only reason you worry is because you have done none of those things. And you worry because you are like out there in the middle of the ocean floundering and you can't get your feet on solid ground. But then it's like you got to either figure out, honey, are you going to sink or learn how to magically swim? Because people do magic and you know, all the time, you know, to save their lives, to get themselves yes. on the right track. They do magical things. And one of those things is the combination of staying cool, calm, and collected. Come on now. You know, like which, and I learned that from my grandfather. If he, if he saw somebody getting out of hand, he said, I need you to stay cool, calm, and collected and i was going to bring up a reference where you said 
out there in the ocean in no man's land. So I'm not sure if you watch tennis ever, but there is a space on the court that they call no man's land. And it's between the baseline where you mostly hit the ball and the service line. Whereas if you move forward, you have to get ready to volley or something. Right. So a coach would always say, if you find yourself in no man's land, then you lose your feet because you don't have the ability to, you know, recognize the depth of the ball. Or if you take it in life terms, it's like you don't have the ability to recognize the depth of the of the trouble that you're about to step Thank into. You. So you got to make a choice. And the biggest choice is to it's kind of like. You know, it's just like you got to relax. You have to relax and figure out and you have to make those miracles every time somebody hits the ball. You know what, Sean? I can see me standing on that stage. I can see you to my left and I can see Leslie Odom to my right. Everything else is basically a blur but I can see you two so vividly in my mind's eye. Do you know the chills that I'm getting on my body right now? Uh, Because I remember there was a scene in applause where Leslie and I were at a table. It was like one of the, you know, we were, and you know, we were, we were chorus boys at the time. You know, we were at a table and you were doing something and I'm like, I need to be focused on my acting and my singing and my movement patterns, you know, but the only thing I could focus on was you. I was just like, she is, I was like, this is unbelievable. It was just amazing to see you just command the character, the stage, the and maneuver your way through producers and directors on stage and off stage. And I have to tell you, Cheryl, I mean, it really set a great foundation for me moving on to my career. And I had no idea where my career was going to go. I just knew that watching you, the way you interacted with people and, you know, you didn't act like a diva. I think even though your character may have been a diva, right? She was a big diva. <laughs> she was a diva. Yes. <laughs> not in the, but not um, always in the good sense. <laughs> no, but I mean, you played her well. But I, I was just saying that you know, you really set a foundation of me to, to be like, yeah, you know, I was new to LA entertainment life, and. The, the the star doesn't always have to act like the star, you know, and it was a you, you taught a really great lesson. I bet you um, Leslie Odom will say the same thing. Um, and, I, you know, I just want to know, like uh, people say the word humble a lot. There are a lot of people out there who, you know, they can't keep their head at level ground. And especially when uh, taking up a, in a leadership position and uh you know, being a star or even just being a boss, you know, they do this power tripping thing. And so how have you been able to like, keep your humbleness, keep your, keep your level headedness? You know something I, I had incredible mentors as I was coming up and I mean really outstanding actors and actresses who literally poured into me sometimes intent with intention and other times by just being who they are. And I will never forget one time Virginia Capers, who won the Tony for Raisin, Best Actress. Mm. And she said to me one day, fame allows you to show the world who you really are. And I was just like, whoa. And I had to go deep with that comment because it wasn't like if you were if you were lovely to look at, if you were good to hear, you know, it was about 
you will show them your behind if that's the kind of person you are, or you will show them your heart if that's the kind of person you are. You will show them your ignorance if that's the kind of person you are. You will show them your wisdom if that's the kind of person you are. You will show them love if you are a loving person. You will show them hate if you are a hateful person. Fame allows you to show the world who you are. Well, first of all, thank you for that. I love that. I need to put that on a (laughs) t-shirt. What about the people who have a hard time handling the stress of life and they do go to that, that hate, you know, that's what's winning over their heart. They never had a loving foundation. They had no idea Mm. who they are. They were on shaky ground to begin with. You get famous. Fame is not um, a firm foundation. Fame is a very shaky platform. You get built up to be knocked down. Look at this. Look Mm. at this time we are in in America where we've had all of these statues built to these great men. Times have changed and things that were acceptable in the past are no longer acceptable now. And what did they do with those venerable statues of greatness? They knocked those mother hubbards down and put them in dark places. I love how you, t- you said fame is built on rocky ground because... You know, when we younger, when you're going through auditions, I mean, even now, if you go to an audition, you walk into a room to audition with having a 50 percent chance of someone saying you're not good enough for this. And you could have been a you could have been a star five weeks ago or five days ago and just came off this amazing show or being a great dancer with this amazing artist and was the lead. And you walk into the next room and people say, well, you know, I I don't want you or you're not good enough. And I think that a lot of times, you know, people who haven't been through that, like they don't see the constant like getting beat down that you go through as a as an actor or a singer or a dancer or someone in the in the entertainment industry. Even my husband and I, we've gotten approached so many times like, oh, we wanted you to do a TV show, you know, with your kids or whatever. And then all of a sudden you don't hear from them again. And you're kind of like, I mean, it used to bother me just because they didn't respond. Right. It's just like, can I get some sort of courteous response? But now after having been through it so many times, it's almost laughable. And then I'm able to tell myself, well, well, I didn't need them or that wasn't right for me. What do you, let's, I just want to get into like the rejection piece because a lot of people struggle with rejection in their life, be it rejection from love, rejection from a job. They don't get that job that they wanted. Rejection from friends, you know, and how do how do you help people handle rejection or just being pushed away or, you know, they just feel defeated because they feel like nobody wants them you know, because I, a lot of people out there do feel alone. I, I wrote about this in my book, Redefining Diva 2.0, available mm. now on Audible. It's a great listen. When you are rejected, once again, this is about building up your response to life. Okay, I used to, I took this one course about jewelry making and I loved copper, right? And you'd get this, this copper wine or these copper sheets, but copper is one of those things you have to beat it, right? You have to get your hammer and you have to beat it and you have to beat it out in order to get it, get your design to develop, or you have to heat it up and get it hot in order to bend it and create it the way you want to. You can, it's soft and it's pliable. Mm. So sometimes you can just bend it and mold it and make it what you want. But sometimes you get to add a little heat to it. So I believe that I carry the brilliance of copper. I am malleable. And I'm going to choose to be in this business of show business, which is all about rejection. You will hear far more no's than you will ever hear 
that one or two, yes, you're perfect. You're wonderful. Now you can get to that point, but you got to wait for it. Because sometimes the next things that comes is now change. Mm. You're perfect. You're wonderful. Oh, now change. Mm. If you don't understand that going into this, please don't come to show business because it will kill you. It will drive you crazy. You will join the state of the mentally ill and broken. Hollywood is full of everybody with a script, with a dream that never came true, never will come true. Just the other day, a producer called me up. He said, I need you for this project, but I've got to respect the choice of the director. No problem. I read it. Oh, I could do this in. Oh, not a problem. But I'm not getting this thing back from the director. I'm like, why is this happening? I said, but that's all right. But I'm going to read and give it my doggone dist. Mm. I give it my doggone dist. I leave it on the floor. Then I get a call back that says she wants somebody else. Was I sad? Hell yeah, I was sad. Was I disappointed? Hell yeah. I was disappointed, but that probably was God saying to me, girl, you did not need to be over there. That was not where you needed to be because I have an assignment for you over here. I need you to take your time in Jamaica. Get yourself right, your body right, because you know you need to lose about 10 pounds. You've been talking to Sean about that same 10 pounds 20 pounds ago. So uh, <laughs> maybe that's what you need to be doing. Let me do God mm. and you do you. So all I can say is figure out kind of what kind of metal you are. Are you steel? What does it take to work with steel? Are you copper? Are you iron? You know, what are, are you silver? Are you gold? Are you platinum? So I I think to myself, who are we in life, Mm. in the business? Who are we? And I'm not going to be defeated by my life. I'm not going to be defeated by where I am. And once you start feeling defeated, you are defeated. Maya Angelou wrote this song, I rise. You can do this to me. You can do that to me. But I rise. I am I am here to meet my life right where I am. I am here mm. to fully participate and engage in my life. I will take a break, but I'm not leaving being in my life. So when you talk about feeling defeated, do you feel, does this look good on you? Does it look good on you like this? Or does it look good on you like this? You have to choose one. You have to make a choice. And and don't get me wrong, honey. Life is hard. If you saw my post this morning, it was about being in a gully. And this this Mm. gully, it was dirty. It was nasty. The gully was full of trash. And the water was basically just a trickle down the gully out into the sea. But I had my camera on and I panned to the left. And there were these artists in the gully painting a beautiful scene. Are you on the gully side or are you going towards the beauty, knowing that I had to get through that nasty, smelly gutty to get to this beauty? That's life sometimes. I know it's difficult, but that's life sometimes. It's nasty, it's dirty, dead dogs flow down the water. And then you come up, up, and I mean literally dead dogs. And then you come Mm. across something beautiful. That's life. 
I think we just need to sit there for a minute. I think people need to just sit in that for a minute because I think the one of the biggest messages I've I got from that whole thing. Well, I got a few messages. Okay, Cheryl. One was be malleable and choose your metal. You know, everybody wants gold, but copper might be good for you. I think a lot of times people are afraid of that gully because the gully really gets a bad rap. And I've said a lot. I've said a lot of times, like, you know, you got to go through struggle from strength. But I, I, I do believe that let's walk through the gully for a second. Let's talk about, you know, let's walk past the dead dogs or the rats or the, you know, the dumpster that smells really bad. Yes. You know, these are things that you remember. And I think the thing that you remember most about the things that you don't want is the fact that you don't want it again. And so when you get to the beauty this is, listen, this is all what I'm learning from you. I'm just regurgitating what has been going through my mind as you have been giving me the wisdom. But I just believe that why is it that beauty is always at the end? Like the beauty was like they weren't painting those beautiful pictures in the middle of the gully. You know, why is the beauty always at the end? Because from what you said, finding your ability to conform or be malleable, I should say, not conform, to be malleable, to be bendable, to be flexible yes. happens first so that when you pass through the dogs and the dumpsters and the rats and the tough times, you have to figure out, like, am I going to go right, left, through? Am I going to jump over? Do I got to go under? Do I have to touch the dumpster at some point? And then you get to the beauty. And I think that is just like, it just makes struggle seem so much more manageable, Absolutely. you know? You can, you can actually go from struggle to strength. I mean, you can literally go from struggle to strength because sometimes the struggle is what makes you strong. I'm a Capricorn and, mm. and, you know, we've been talking about now it's Capricorn season. I'm a natural mountain climber. So I climb... I hold on, I rest at plateaus, I look up, I look at it and I say, okay, the shape of this mountain, how much further? And I start climbing again. And when you, sometimes when you climb mm. mountains, you have to eat a tin can. And sometimes I think we're the only, only one sometimes we could just eat a tin can and get something good out of the tin can and carry on up that mountain but once you get to the top of that mountain or once you get as far as you can go sometimes the beauty of what you can see is just amazing just amazing you said something you you defined an experience that scott and i had about uh seven eight years ago i don't even know how long ago it was now maybe six seven i don't remember but we went to south africa and we went to cape town and we climbed table mountain we started climbing we started at the street and our our tour our climbing guide if you will was like we're not doing the touristy way he was like we are going to really climb this mountain and we neither one of us had mountain climbing experience but we just had to we just had to trust and believe that this gentleman was going to take us on the path so anyway we, we parked on a street by the time we got to the base of the mountain Cheryl I, we have felt like we had done an insanity workout I'm talking about just walking from the street yes. there was nothing to climb it was a slight incline like maybe five seven degree incline and you and your heart is starting to pound but anyway, we start going up the mountain, and this is where I started to realize that people's definition of being sad about being on a plateau is just that they forget that it's a, it's a balancing act at that point. You just have to celebrate the climb. But the thing that you said most important was that you might you need to eat a tin can. So Scott and I are climbing this mountain, and so we are so focused on getting to the top. We are so focused on like, we're so fit. Like, oh my gosh, like we can't show that we're tired. We get to one of the, we get to our first plateau, I think. And it was pretty high up. 
And he sat down. The tour guy sat down. His name was Dominic. Dominic sat down and pulled out some croissants and a tin can of hot coffee. And we had our water. And he sat down. He didn't say, do you want to sit down? He just sat down. And he said, we're going to drink from this tin can. And so he was like, I know you guys are fit. But sometimes you you need a breather when you don't know you need ooh, a breather. Ooh. And you need to sit down when you don't know you need to sit down. And so I was like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, sometimes you need a rest when you don't know it. Yep. And sometimes you're going to get rejected because you should be rejected. Sometimes you're not ready for it. Sometimes it's not where you're supposed to be. Sometimes it is exactly what you do not need. Yeah, that part. Mm. People talking about kicking down doors and all of that. Sometimes you just need to build your own doggone castle. You might break your leg trying to kick down somebody else's door. You might shoot the wrong person. Shoot. Mm -mm. I mean, you said a lot there, but I'm going to focus on when you're kicking down the wrong door because I believe that happens a A lot lot. in relationships. Ooh, wait a minute. Let's talk re- about it. Ooh, man, okay, I have a pain ahead. in my bag. I pulled a muscle and it is just giving me what I'm not <laughs> looking for. Shoot. So, so I have, my friend says to me, girl, I am trying to tell my husband something, but he is not listening. So I immediately shut up, right? Because I learned mm. when somebody's going to tell you something about somebody that they love, you better just listen. Don't say anything too fast because it's none of your business. <laughs> And they're really just trying to bounce something off of you. So she says Mm -hmm. to me, I'm trying to give him all of these signs. I am trying to tell him that he needs to pay attention more to me. But every time I send him the sign, send him the message, he's just not getting it. And I was just like, And then she says, well, aren't you going to say anything? I said, oh, you want me to say something? I said, you can't be subtle with some people. You might just have to, mm. you might just have to say to him, look, I don't like this flavor of ice cream. You keep giving it to me. I keep telling you I don't like this flavor either I'm going to have to go get myself what I like. Which means you don't get to give me ice cream anymore because I ain't licking that. Sometimes you got to make it plain just like that. You know, it's so funny you say that uh, just about relationships because when I, when I met Scott, he... He's from Seattle and he's just so like he just has a demeanor of just like his family was just like they're just really nice people. And not that I'm not, but I'm from Jersey. And so the way we communicated where I'm from was just like you. I'm like, if you don't tell me what it is, boom. Or the way that I say things, he used to think I was being like rude or not rude, but he just thought I was being aggressive. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not mad. I'm just saying exactly what it is because I realized when you beat around the bush you're just going to keep running around the bush and let me tell you something I just I don't really have time for that like I just got to get I got to get from point A to point B and I have to be efficient so it's just interesting to hear that a lot of times when out in relationships when people complain or when they need to bounce those ideas off of you it's just that they're not being direct or they have fear of confrontation. Right. And, you know, my husband used to always say, oh, you love confrontation. I'm like, no, I don't. I just don't. I just know that by confronting something, we're going to get to the end of this uncomfortable situation. And I think, like you just said, it is a fear of confrontation. I think so many of us have a habit of being nice or just getting through not wanting to hurt anybody's feelings that we become basically emotionally ineffective. Mm. We're, we're just, we're just going through the motions to get to the next 
place without basically saying, no, we're going to climb a little higher. We're just going to stay on this plateau because if I don't look up and figure out how am I going to get higher, I'm not going to get higher. We're going to stay on that plateau. What I love to ask my guests, and this is probably the most important question, and I'm so excited to ask you, is what does trust and believe mean to you? And was there ever any situation where you were like, you know what? Trust and belief is the only thing that I have right now. Okay, it comes exactly to my mind. And it's usually, you know, trust and believe is one of those church sayings. And it's like, you've got to trust. Mm. You've got to trust that it's going to be all right. You've got to believe that it's going to be all right. You've got to trust what I told you and believe that what I told you is all right. And it's going to be all right. You've got to trust in yourself and believe that you're going to take yourself to where it is you need to go. You've got to trust and believe. And I remember very clearly when I got divorced, I thought that I would never smile again. I thought that my life was over. I really thought that I was just going to die. I could not figure out how I was going to make it. I had two children. I had a home. I had to hold on to it. I had to raise my children. I had to keep my my home together. And I just did not know how I was going to do that. You know, nobody had ever been divorced in my family. And here I was, the failure, the divorced failure. And one day my mother looked at me and said, trust and believe you will smile again. Mm. And I don't know what it was about her saying that to me. But the next great moment I remember working through that, I was looking at myself in the mirror, brushing my teeth. And I was looking at myself in the mirror. And all of a sudden, I just, you know, sprayed all the toothpaste out and I just started smiling and laughing. And I was just like, whoa, okay, okay, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to be all right. Then I started to be all right. Mm. So I was literally in a dark place and I had to trust and believe what my mother told me, that it was going to be all right, that I would smile again. One of the things I got from that is that people trap themselves in a cage so much that they don't, like, understand that, like, it really just takes you unlocking that door. And it takes one smile. It takes one change. Like, kind of like what we talked about earlier, one step in a direction to really transform that mindset. And... It, and, and, and those steps that we kind of talked about earlier, you know, walks you in the path of trusting and believing in who you are. Cheryl, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I want to give you and I and Alex, our producer, my producer, a pat on the back because we got through some some times. Team Sean T showed up, fixed some mics. We got some extra headphone headpieces. Even I got, I got a little headpiece up I love here today. It. I love it. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, I just love how we were able to take something that was going to take 45 minutes and say, you know what? It's going to take as long as it takes. If it takes an hour and a half. It's an hour and a half. It takes an hour and a half. Right. We're going to get through it because that's the choice we made. We're going to get through it comfortably. We're going to get through it better. And we're going to get through it all right. Trust and believe. We make better choices. We lead, be- we lead better lives. I'm done, Alex. That was it. That was the close of this podcast. I don't got to listen. <laughs>